Tomorrow marks 20 years since the start of the siege of Sarajevo. The city came under attack from Serb forces during the Bosnian War, killing 10,000 people. It's a story we covered extensively on this broadcast, featuring the work of two of CBC's most distinguished journalists, Carol Off and Anna Maria Tremonti. And 20 years later, both of them recently returned to Sarajevo to rediscover a city scarred and reshaped by conflict. War is hell. Any war is hell. 500,000 shells or mortars had come from those hills and killed a minimum of 10,000 people just in Sarajevo. It's the abandonment. It's to, it's, it's to realize that in the middle of Europe, that this could go on in a small country for four years and that no one would show up to try and stop it. The battle has been going on all night. And I felt that the more stories I did, the more people here would understand. And the way to understand what a war is, is to look at what it does to the citizens who live there. They don't make choices about war. They get stuck in it. How do you live through something like that and then just, you know, oh, the war is over, let's go on with our lives? So I'm very interested, 20 years later, to see how far they've come and to see what lingers. We're both going back to visit the scene of a war, and, um, and a war that Anna Maria covered, and we're also going back to see the scene of a crime, as the crime that I covered. Sarajevo 84. Everyone had fallen in love with Sarajevo during the Winter Olympics. At the starting line, paired with Hans Magnusson of Sweden. And there was this giant outdoor skating rink, the speed skating rink that was there. Gaetan Boucher is the winner of the gold. Here it was, the very place. At row upon row upon row of grave markers because people couldn't get to any of the cemeteries. They were in the line of fire. And so they buried their mothers and their fathers and their children in this place. And it, it, it's the place that breaks my heart. Sarajevo, when I got there, was a city surrounded. It was already under siege. The siege had begun. and. Nobody moved slowly. Even when it's calm, this is a city of fear, where nervous people dash through open areas, hoping to avoid stray mortars, where drivers race at breakneck speeds in areas known to have snipers. In fact, we're right on what was a front line. Uh, you know, it's funny, you see people strolling on both sides of this river. They would have not have been able to, and they, on both sides, they used it as a front line. There were sniper nests in every high-rise behind us. Um, would you have ever come here during the war? I couldn't get this close. It's indicative of how much of a front line this was, that these trees that we see are old, because nobody could cut them down for firewood, because people were desperate. And in other parts of this city, they cut the trees down to burn the wood because they had no fuel. And uh, these trees are still old and standing because nobody could get to them because it was too close to the action. It's interesting to watch people just strolling along now, isn't it? It's interesting and there's also, to see people strolling along here and they pass by the very place where in 1992, in that week in April, when it all, the first shots, the first casualties of the siege of Sarajevo, these two young women, Olga and Suada, who were among this protest, who were saying, don't do this. We, we, we want to stay together. Don't attack our city. <laughs> Snipers fired the first shots, actually, from this side. They fired the first shots and killed these two women in the protest. one day we were in a children's ward and the doctor actually went by granite. sniper granite. grenade granada i think she called it and that's what 
the kids were in there for. Those were the injuries. And there was a little baby who's covered in burns. No burn tent, nothing. You know, just there with whatever medications they had. It was just so heart-wrenching. And I remember it really well because I was so overwhelmed that I actually fainted. Shrapnel hit 10-year-old Azima the day her neighbor's house was shelled. She remembers how her mother fell and shouted that her foot had been blown off, and how she rushed to grab her baby sister from her wounded mother's arms. The story of the kids became really important to me because there were kids everywhere when you go into Bosnia and you cover this and you realize they're totally helpless. They don't know what's going on. There's a children's monument in downtown Sarajevo. You've probably seen it. And it's dedicated to the thousands of children who died just in Sarajevo. Um, while we were there, just a woman came to just pay tribute to her, her daughter, nine-year-old girl who was killed. She was only not yet, you know, She was killed by the grenade. She had her own children now, she will This is what all the talking is about, getting medicine and other aid to the victims of the war. And despite the best efforts of people like Anna Maria Tremonti, who was covering it, trying to tell us about this unarmed population and the attack, I had really conflicted views, but didn't think that there was a principle involved. It's just an ugly little conflict in a small part of the world. And so it was only at the very end of the war, the last couple of months, this when I arrived and I saw and I heard and I began to investigate that the horrible revelation came to me that I had been terribly wrong. But I learned quickly that what Sarajevo represented was very much like what was in my own country, which was that it was a multi-ethnic society trying to hold on to that principle and that value of people living together. And it was attacked by a, a, a very well-armed army, what was left of the Yugoslav National Army and the Serbian forces, who wanted to destroy that idea in order to create what they called Greater Serbia. We are defending Christianity after all. We are defending Christianity against them. Muslim fundamentalism. A deeply divided country accepted a troubled peace plan. Then began the job of finding the missing people, those who'd been sent to camps, who had fled as refugees, and the bodies of those killed. Tens of thousands are still missing. Part of my responsibility now was not just to look at this as like, oh my gosh, we didn't recognize what happened. Now we have to investigate this crime. One of the key people was, of course, leader of the, the Serbian forces and, well, leader of the, the whole campaign, the senior politician, a man named Radovan Karadzic. And Radovan Karadzic was at large. Um, and uh, he was indicted as the guy, the mastermind of this, uh, of this giant crime, of this, of this ethnic cleansing, this genocide. And, um, and yet no one could catch him. And so I went back to his village and talked to the people there. And I went to met, met his mother. Is this your favorite picture? Then when we did finish doing the interview and she realized that she was now going to have to explain to those who said she wasn't supposed to talk to anyone. And she said that we had cast a spell on her and that we had used black magic to get the interview. Radovan Karadzic went on for, for another decade. It was only in the past couple of years that they, they were able to find him riding a city bus in Belgrade um, and finally arrest him. And now he's on trial in The Hague. But every single person you talk to has been a victim of a crime. And everybody has a story to tell of what happened to them. And I, I think there's still a sense that justice has not been done and will not be done. 
I talked to two women who were raped, two separate villages. Um, and these two women actually took their pregnancies to term and they are raising the children who are the result of those rapes. And um, it's a great shame in their life. They don't, they don't even want to be alive. They are alive for that child. And uh, I talked to one woman who says uh, her son does not know. He will never know. She will never tell him. So, so he doesn't ask where his dad is, and she doesn't say. But she doesn't forget. And this boy who gives her so much joy, his coming about was the cause of so much pain. I wanted to go back to Sarajevo because it was a place that deeply, deeply moved me. And I have to say that I found a place a vibrancy of charm and joy in so many ways, a place also still broken uh, and needing repair, a place that um, is still suffering from our neglect during the war and after the war. Well, there's a pride in Sarajevo. There's pain, there's trauma, there are very bad memories, but there is also a pride and there's a hope for the future of Sarajevo, not just this year or next year, but long-term future. <laughs>